All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get back into our interpreting the meaning of Bible stories, following Riken's uh, outline here in uh, biblical narrative. And um, that's, we, I began it last time by talking about uh, how the dramatized scenes with the very, very sparse and limited commentary, um, uh, it first of all assumes, and this is more of a, a statement about presuppositions, and I, I did state this, it requires or and presumes that we share the moral framework of the reader. Now you could say if it's a document for the Jews written in Jewish, uh, written in you know the uh, Hebrew script, then of course it's it's for them. But we, to this day, uh, other people will read those stories and find themselves similarly uh, respondent to the moral um, or immoral conduct displayed in the story. So that it says something about human nature there, which I just, just think is really interesting. It's not a literary observation. It's more of a hermeneutic one. It assumes what, as I said last time, C.S. Lewis calls the Tao, this uh, common human moral framework, which is sometimes called uh, natural law. Um, but uh, whatever we want to call it, it, it assumes that that is the case. And, uh, and I think that it's true. It, and, and otherwise, it doesn't work. And it certainly doesn't work across uh, 2,500, 3,000 years from the time with, in which they were written to this day. So, however, we do find sometimes there's a cultural difference between the framework of the, the author's writing then, so the writing in a desert, there's, you know, the agrarian society, there's a talk of shepherds and so forth. The moral framework has stayed basically the same. There's no problem with translation there. And if there is any discrepancy between how the, uh, the story assumes that we're going to read it and how we read it, that is largely uh, a matter of um, how our society is at odds with the biblical understanding, and that doesn't mean that we're right, and I, I addressed that at the outset. So just because we find something offensive doesn't mean that, it's, uh, that we're correct in our assumptions on that, uh, but it could, we could be correct but we probably are misreading the story. That's my general assumption. So I talked about various devices of uh, disclosure. I talked about the effective strategies, how the uh, reader or the writer uh, touches or plays upon the reader's heart uh, as part of the story. And he doesn't do it by talking about his feelings. He does it by motivating the reader to feel certain things. So these are important strategies. Uh, any good author will will do this, will be able to move the reader, but not tell you about he, how he or she is feeling. That's irrelevant to the enjoyment of the, of the reader, quite frankly. It's the product of bad writing that the, the author tells you about his or her feelings all the time. Um, and these depend on how, how sophisticated the writer is in being able to evoke the, the responses that, uh, that he wants. Um, I think I also, and I think I left off here with Naboth's vineyard and the discussion there in uh, 1 Kings 21, that story of Ahab, the wicked man, uh, confronting this little uh, guy, the little guy, Naboth. The king wants his vineyard. Naboth says no. Uh, Jezebel comes and murders him and takes the vineyard. So it's a classic story of uh, a very good little guy and then there's the big bad guy and then there's judgment on it so there are all sorts of uh, almost stereotype or st stereotypical uh, uh, features of that story um, and so that's where I talked about the effective strategies in illustrating that and I'm not going to go into that particular passage but you but that would be a good one to look at the effective strategies there and certainly Riken does talk about that I want to move on to talk about um, patterns of, uh, uh, of repetition. And I did say that, so I am to some degree reiterating. But the, 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 the threefold and sometimes even three plus one uh, repetition in stories, which is a feature. It's not because they're doing the equivalent of stuttering. It is because it's a, it's a feature of storytelling that patterns are repeated uh, and with that repetition, 
you're, you can emphasize certain things, but you can also amplify them to some degree because there's a slight variation in the repetition. So in, in poetry, there tend, you, you see the same thing said twice, but not quite in the same way, not the exact same words. And the second saying uh, uh, will in some, some ways amplify what's said in the, in the first. Same with the storytelling. Um, and then I talk, but I, I think I left off with the archetypes, which uh, again, Professor Jordan Peterson has made so much of. And so does Northrop Fry, and I think it's really important actually, uh, and uh, very interesting. Well, I find that fascinating, I always did find it fascinating that there are common, uh, what scholars would call ur myths. I need to write that down because you would never guess it if you didn't know how it was written because it's a German word. So it's with a U-R, ur myths. So archetypal, original stories that we see are common to uh, children's stories and so forth. You can even see them played upon in Hollywood uh, stories to this day, or, or Disney type stories. Um, and I, I talked about some of those where there's a hero and then there's a villain and they have very stereotypical features. And why, why do those features appear because, good question, because that's the pattern of human experience, because it plays upon our affections in the same way in every culture. I don't know, just know that they are there, the explanation for it is, is another matter, but you can certainly see a, a commonality between the biblical stories and again, the, the sort of nursery rhyme type, Brothers Grimm, Disney uh, type of stories. Uh, and and the, the 12 specific forms, this is where I left off on page 49, he has given uh, there of a sort of monomyth, a universal narrative pattern. And these have sometimes specific forms. So there can be a quest narrative, very common in the Romantic period. Uh, there's a death and rebirth motif obviously most uh, in some ways anticipating uh, Christ's death and resurrection. That would be the reason why that uh, death rebirth motif would be there. But you can see the death rebirth motif in literature more broadly, not just in uh, Christian stories. Uh, there's an initiation type of story uh, of, of which becomes characteristic of the novel in the 18th century, it's called a Bildungsroman. It's a type of uh, novel in which the character is brought in to uh, learn and educate uh, himself. Uh, there's a journey, stereotypical story of, uh, of journeys, which are rife in all literature and in scripture. There's a tragic type of narrative, a fall from innocence. They're all over the place. Uh, a, com a comic structure there begins in prosperity. There's a fall from that and then there's a, uh, a return to a happy ending. That would be the structure of a comedy. A tragedy would, do, uh, would begin in a crisis. It would peak and it would then, in a possible resolution, then it would fall off into catastrophe. Um, themes of crime and punishment, themes of temptation, the idea of a rescue, there's the suffering servant motif, I'm just listing, is the rags to riches motif, which he calls the Cinderella story, which is uh, extraordinarily powerful. Is it just wish fulfillment? Uh, if it's wish fulfillment, it seems to be pretty universal and it plays upon people's sensibilities. Uh, even if they're crusty and grumpy, they still like the Cinderella story. Uh, and then the movement from, from ignorance to insight, that again is characteristic of, of biblical writing and often that will take place through, through suffering even. Uh, finally, there is something called type scenes. And uh, these are, he 
Reichen is mentioning these, but he's largely taken them from the work of Robert Alter. Uh, Alter writes in the 70s, the book that he uh, became famous in the field is The Art of Biblical Narrative. Uh, and uh, he talks about uh, type scenes. So the woman at the well. The woman at the well is all over the Bible. Uh, why is it all over the well? Because it's a common experience in that society for people to go to the well for water. And the women are the ones that do it, apparently. Without water, there's no life if you're in the desert. So the woman goes to the well to fetch a pail of water out of it. And while they're there, and of course the herds are there, they meet a man. And then they get married. But there are also uh, scenes of temptation there and adultery that go with it. But lots of scenes like Jacob. Uh, and, and I mean, Jacob is probably the prototypical one there servant uh, where right so that's the story but then Jesus also meets a woman at a well and everybody who has a, an ear to how biblical narrative not only uh, works through types but the repetition of the types immediately will think of that earlier type here's a woman at a well she meets a young man what's going on here there's a there's a tension there <coughs> and as we, as it turns out uh, she's there loitering perhaps with intent She's met many men at the well, in fact. She's on her fifth husband, as Jesus tells her. She's shocked by this. But there, so that's in the background and, and probably part of the, the composite way that you would read that particular story. So there's a woman at a well, yes, but she's there and probably there not just to fetch water, but maybe meets men there. At least it's sitting there in the reader's consciousness. It's not in the actual text that that is the case, but it, it, it could be. It comes to mind at any rate. Um, some of the type scenes here will take the form and uh, of, uh, let's see here, um, the Exodus epic. I'll mention these uh, in more detail here. So the Exodus epic has certain patterns. They begin with a, a crisis. So when Moses takes the people of God, uh, actually throughout Exodus, begins with a crisis. What's the crisis that, with which Exodus begins? Because it begins with a crisis, right? What's the crisis? They're slaves. They've grown too numerous and so much so that their firstborn are going to have to be, firstborn males are going to have to be killed. Edict of Pharaoh, that's a pretty big crisis. The people cry out to the Lord, complain first of all, then they cry out to the Lord. So two things, they complain, then they cry out to the Lord, uh, and then he rescues them. The fourth part, he shows them that he's a savior. This is where we get the first portrait of God as Savior. It's in, in the book of Exodus. And the vehicle for that is, of course, Moses, who then also becomes a lawgiver. And so the idea of sa salvation is thereafter connected with liberation from the bondage of slavery and also linked with the giving of the law. Here's how you shall live. Here's how you were living. It was a means of oppression and bondage and cruelty and potential death and idolatry and all of those things. And the, the liberation that takes place uh, provides uh, a counterpart to all of those ailments. Yes? Noah. With the, uh, the wipes out all of humanity, the one family. Yeah, well, there's no people that are saved. It's, it's only his family. And there's a new beginning. I, I don't see it quite there in the same pattern. Uh, Noah seems to be fit more the pattern of a, of a creation. So God creates the human family, Adam and Eve. And uh, the, the people become so wicked that he, he's, 
he's going to wipe them all out, save this one family, and then start over. So it's more that story of Noah is echoing the story of creation, and here there's a, a new creation, which is, you can see in Christian thinking, there's the old covenant, and there's the new covenant, there's a new creation taking place. So that that is echoed there. But I don't think the same pattern of what we have here in, in Exodus of salvation is there in I mean, obviously, Noah and his family are saved, but there's no sense that it has wider implications because it, there's nobody being redeemed. They're all being destroyed, save Noah's family, and then he'll repopulate them. And from that family, then, of course, his sons very quickly go astray, and then people of the rest of the earth, but there's the same problem recurs again, even with the new creation. But to the pattern of new creation is, is established there in the, the Noah story. Whereas this one is the idea of, of God as savior, um, solving the crisis of slavery that the people, his people have uh, been unable to extricate themselves. And remember in that, uh, it's really interesting, when, when Abraham is first called, he, it's actually stated that they will live in the land of Egypt for 400 years, and then he'll bring them out back in the Genesis account. Now this isn't really predictive. Uh, remember these are the books of Moses. So it's not a chronological statement it's saying this is what's going to happen. God uh, was always going to do this until uh, such time as uh, the sins against uh, re reference to the Amalekites are actually have built up to the point where I will now judge. Anyway, uh, so the, there's the, the four points. There's a crisis, the people complain, secondly. Thirdly, they call out to God. So complaining is not enough, they have to call out to God. Fourthly, then he rescues them. And then finally, there is a revelation at the end of it. A theophany. God reveals himself. And, and with that, and this is important, there's a rebuke that comes with it. Note in the uh, in the Ten Commandments, there's a lot of "Thou shalt not." But even at the outset of that statement, so the the giving of the Ten Commandments it says, "I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt." Important introduction. It's part of the Ten Commandments. He's revealed himself even in that, in what he just did, and therefore you shall have no other gods beside me. Martin Luther calls this first commandment righteousness. Because I am the savior and I am the God of life, you shall not worship other gods, you shall not have idols, etc., etc. But you shall have no need of those things because I am the Lord. Look up first commandment righteousness and, and Luther on it if you're further interested in that but those five features of the of the exodus epic uh, to some degree you can see replicated in the gospel accounts when jesus is presented as a new moses leading his people to the promised land like uh, his namesake joshua yeshua right um in the Gospel of John, there's, there's a type scene of misunderstood statements. There are nine of them. Nine times Jesus says something and is misunderstood. The pattern is, is there. I'm not going to go through all the uh, instances, although they're referred to in uh, Riken's text. Um, but on those, there, those nine instances of misunderstanding, there are three stages. There's a Jesus pronounces something. Uh, there are bystanders who are hearing him and they misunderstand what he says and then Jesus has to clarify their misunderstanding. It's just a consistent feature of it. So much so that it can't be accidental. It is a literary feature of the encounters. Uh, similarly in the book of Acts there's a, also a pattern, a, a type scene as it were. F five stages. First of all, he raises up leaders to preach the gospel. 
stage one. Clear at the outset, right? First, he raises up leaders. Secondly, they perform mighty works. After they've been raised up, they do extraordinary acts. Miraculous things. Uh, thirdly, the crowds come and many are converted. Fourthly, opposition arises and the leaders are persecuted. And then fifthly, God intervenes and rescues the leaders. But it's a consistent pattern. If the book of Acts is the manual for the church and how the gospel is to be enacted, the example of the early disciples, then this five-fold pattern is almost normative for how Christians should expect the world to respond. First of all, God will raise up the leaders to preach the gospel. When they do this, they will perform mighty works. There's a difference of opinion amongst uh, Christians. Does this mean the sign gifts and I don't think those are the mighty gifts anyway, but um, the mighty works, but huge conversions and extraordinary signs and uh, um, demonstrations of the Spirit's power. And then the crowds come, and many conversions follow. And then once that happens, then the opposition arises, and it, it, it persecutes those who were called to begin with. So it's just like the prophets. And then finally, God intervenes and rescues those leaders. That's the pattern. Sometimes it leads to martyrdom, but not always. Like Stephen is not the, uh, the norm there in the book of Acts. It does happen, clearly, and then he is like Jesus in that sense. But that's not the case for the other disciples. So the, the, the 12 are not martyred in the text. We find out from church history that they are martyred after the canon of scripture has been written. So all of the apostles, but not, not in the book of Acts, they're not. Right? So comments or questions here? Before I want to, before I move on to the elements of narrative and how the stories actually work. Hearing none, okay. Um, so there are three, three basic elements to the stories and how they work. And these are, you will find this in any description of stories. You could pluck this out of Aristotle. Uh, there are three basic elements. There's the setting of the story. There is the uh, plot or the action. which Aristotle says when he's talking about the tragedy, it's the most important aspect, not through the biblical narrative. I wholly agrees with that. And the third part is character. It almost seems to me like character is as, if not more important than the action. The action's a, an opportunity for character to be forged or revealed in the action. In fact, character is revealed through the action. So again, we don't know what's in the hearts of the individuals that are acting except in the way that they act or respond to often um, oppression or crises, etc. Then character is revealed under pressure of some sort. So once again, go, if you go back to what I just said about the book of Acts, God gives miraculous uh, gifts. So he calls people to preach. He gives them uh, sign gifts. Great crowds gather. Okay, that's one aspect of their character, but that doesn't demonstrate much character. It demonstrates uh, a, a calling, a vocation. The character is demonstrated when they are persecuted and how they respond. How do they respond? Well, they respond often in a way that we would not expect. They are rejoicing for being persecuted. They're defiant in the face of threats to stop preaching. Think about it. 
and then they're liberated, like from whether a jail cell is blasted open, but they're, they're singing in chains. They won't stop. So that, again, reveals character. But these are how the story, stories work. So these three basic elements, and the writer's goal is to bring us to empathize with the characters. Here's a great uh, quotation. This is from Flannery O'Connor, the great American author of the past century, uh, chronicler of the American South in some ways, great Catholic novelist. She, she, she writes that a, a storyteller speaks, quote, with character and action, not about character and action. With character and action, not about character and action. The about would be a commentary by the narrator on what has happened. Whereas if the characters themselves speak and act, there's already, we're, we don't need somebody to interpret for us what has happened. It's far more powerful. That's how O'Connor writes her short stories. And I think that uh, it's clear that that's how the Bible writes its stories. Very little in the way of narrative commentary. Because the narrative commentary would detract from the power of the narrative if that were the case. So it's, there's a lot of direct, I, I talked about this uh, before, a lot of direct speech and direct action. So direct narrative and dramatic narrative. And dramatic narrative is the overwhelming uh, preponderance of, of what we're getting in the stories is dramatic narrative. So actors speaking to one another. So once again, a storyteller speaks with character and not action, not about character and action. And uh, so now let me parse it down. So the setting, I mentioned three things. So setting, plot, or action, if you will, and thirdly, character. Let's talk about the setting. Uh, we can think of setting in, in, the, in three ways. The physical setting, which tends to be very basic, pastoral. Shepherds and sheep, uh, basic human experiences, life in a, a city or in a house or in a kingdom. Uh, the almost universal uh, human experience expressed in it. Uh, there's a temporal setting. We can be told it happened under the reign of this or that king. And when it says this or that king, we'll often be told what that king's reign was like as well. And it tends to be good or bad. Important context, but it doesn't tend to go into much greater detail than that. Uh, and then the cultural setting. Uh, so back in Genesis 22, I talked about this as such an important text. Uh, when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, uh, in his day, people did sacrifice their children to gods, idols. And Abraham's own people would probably have done this, in fact. And the people of Israel continued to do it. It was called Moloch, the god Moloch, Moloch worship. You've heard of the god Moloch, the big bronze statue that gets heated up. And, they, and, the, and the consort to Baal, the, the sex god. So Moloch and, uh, and Baal or, and, and Moloch or Ash, Ash, the Ashtoreth. And, but, so the, the consorts, uh, in this case, you sacrifice your child, your first fruits, uh, as it were, to this god. Worship of death in some ways. Uh, very common in that area of the world and in human history. There are child sacrifices and, in fact, your own children sacrificed. Um, so that's the context for Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, it looks a lot like this is what God, who's calling Abraham, wants Abraham to do. Is Abraham really aware of what God is like or is he thinking this is just what is done and now I'm being asked to do this? adds a layer of ambiguity to the story for sure.
with respect back to the physical aspects of the setting, um, they tend to be very concrete, the settings. Scenes that uh, if you lived in that area of the world, you would recognize immediately because it would be in your own context. Uh, things like wells. Wells, as I say, would be the centerpiece of, of life in uh, desert cultures. Um, but other features about it. Uh, on the other hand, there's also aspects which are indeterminate. So let me uh, read the quotation from Eric Auerbach's commentary. One, uh, that commentary, by the way, I've mentioned Mimesis a few times. It's a really great uh, essay in that called Odysseus's Scar. And he, he compares the passage, if you recall, uh, in the Odyssey where Odysseus's nurse discovers who he is by bathing him and and uh, in the process he pulls up his whatever he's called whatever it's called and and sees the scar on his leg and then recognizes you're the boy that got the scar and the scar he got back when he was I don't know seven or eight hunting with his father the boar's tusk went through his leg and she recognized even though he's his appearance has completely changed and he's trying to disguise himself, the scar gives him away. And then it goes on at great length, over hundreds and hundreds of lines, how he got to have this scar. And then it, and then it peels back to what it began with, which is the encounter between Odysseus and his nurse, and he you know, grabs her by the throat and tells her to be quiet or he'll kill her. Like, hmm, nice to see you too. <laughs> but, uh, but that extended digression happens in, in, in Greek narrative. It never happens in biblical narrative. So that's, that's Auerbach's commentary on uh, both Greek narrative, which can have those long extended digressions. Again, in Herodotus, you also have the same sort of uh, narrative structure in his stories. Long digressions about how this happened, then he comes back to the original story. It's quite powerful, actually. But biblical narrative doesn't do that. It's it's invariably brief, and it's as as Auerbach says, it's fraught with background. So it, it, there's a lot that it just simply doesn't talk about, and we have to uh, sit there and guess, and infer, and ruminate and expose it. But it really pushes us to think uh, beyond what the words are themselves saying. Uh, this is Auerbach's commentary, though, on uh, how we are brought to infer something. And I'm going to read it from you exactly. Uh, and this is a, the commentary on Abraham and Isaac. Where are the two speakers? If you think about this, they go to Mount Moriah, right? Abraham, Isaac. But he says, where are the two speakers? We're not told. The reader, however, knows that they are not normally to be found together in one place on earth. That one of them, God, in order to speak to Abraham, must come from somewhere, must enter the earthly realm from some unknown heights or depths. Moreover, the two speakers are not on the same level. If we conceive of Abraham in the foreground, where it might be possible to picture him as prostrate or kneeling or bowing with outspread arms or gazing upward, God's not there too. Abraham's words and gestures are directed towards the depths of the picture or upward. But in any case, the undetermined dark place from which the voice comes to him is not in the foreground, and hence the phrase fraught with background. Where does this voice come from? He hears the voice unmistakably, but where exactly is this encounter taking place that's gonna stop Abraham? First of all, he's gonna tell him to do what he's going to do, and then he's gonna stop him from doing it. Where does that encounter actually take place? It's mysterious where God is, and yet it's unmistakable for Abraham that it is God. In both cases, sacrifice your son, don't sacrifice your son. He knows in both instances it's God. How does he know? Where is God? Not presented in that, so it's indeterminate. Again, a feature of biblical writing that I really don't see how that has any correspondence in the Greek literature, for instance, of the, the period. There a God will appear like Athena in the guise of a woman or a young boy or mentor or whatever, 
but there, it's clear where, where this other figure is, right? It's abundantly clear from the text. Here it's not clear. It's totally uh, indeterminate. Yes? Could it also be indeterminate of if other people could hear it? So like, could Isaac hear God speaking through him? And stuff That's like a that? really good, I, I've often wondered that. It's clear with sometimes with the prophets, the prophets here, and only the prophets here, and then they go tell everyone what they've heard from God. But it's, I don't really get the sense that uh, anyone other than the person being addressed hears. I don't, at least it's not from the text. It's not mm -hmm. evident in the text. So it, whereas we're told that Abraham does hear, now that doesn't say that the others don't hear, but it's, so it's just saying nothing. You know, Abraham's son, I mean, think of that. Even with it, he's older. How old is how old is Isaac when this happens? There there are various accounts of this. Some present him as a as an adult even. Like and so his old man's gonna throw him on a pyre and or and, and, and is gonna sacrifice him with a knife and he's gonna allow this to happen? On what basis? Why would he willingly let, uh, let that happen? Has he heard from God himself or has he heard from Abraham? That, I mean, duty goes to your dad goes to a certain limit, but uh, really you're going to cut my throat and sacrifice me here? Okay. And, and so let's go, the two of us up here, and then, you know, where's the sacrifice? God will provide the sacrifice, says Abraham. It's a really interesting and ironic, I mean, the, the tension there is, is uh, palpable. And when you know the story, of course, there's the irony that we know that there's going to be a lamb caught or a ram caught in the thicket, and that will be the sacrifice. But Abraham doesn't know when he says it. So there's an irony between the audience and Abraham, who's oblivious to the fact that what he's just said is going to become true in a way that he hasn't anticipated it. Or maybe he has, because he knows that God won't do that. I don't know. But he's trusting in God. He does it by faith. And in fact, I think it's probably likely he does not know because God credits him with being willing to do it and without thinking, you know, I'm going to go through the motions here because I know God's gonna, not going to do this. No, he, he's willing to do it and has no idea how God's going to stop it, if he's going to stop it. He's been told to do it, so he's going to do it. So all of that is there like what's going on in Abraham's mind what's going on in Isaac's mind where is God speaking from how does he how does Abraham become so clear in his own mind that the God who called him long ago uh, and told him he was going to have offspring and the offspring would be as many as the grains of the seashore the stars in the heaven whatever and that all nations would call him the father of all nations and here's the boy that he's been waiting with and now he's going to sacrifice I mean what's going on through his head I mean this would Am I imagining this? I mean, have I not? Maybe I need a drink from that well because I, you know, I'm lightheaded. I'm imagining. I'm hearing God tell me to kill the boy. He told me would be my heir. But he's clear that it is God. How does he know that it's God? It sounds like a demon to me. It sounds like one of the idols that, like Moloch. It sounds like it in the sense, but he knows that it's God. That of that much, he's certain. How about Isaac again? So those questions are all there. And that's why the passage is so potent. And then on top of that layer, then you think about uh, the Father, God, and Christ, the Son, which he, again, he's willing to sacrifice. That, so there's that typology there in that text and then in the, biblical, the uh, New Testament text. God brings his, the Father sends his Son. The Son... Uh, chooses to lay down his life. He comes to realize that this is his vocation and is willing to do it in obedience to the Father. Clearly the Father has laid it down that it be so. Huge mystery in the, in the text. Indeterminacy there. But, but the indeterminacy is so powerful that it determines everything. Yes? Did it makes it easier to think of the replacement sacrifice being a lamb? Because the, 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 
I just said that. You're in your own head. That's okay. Yeah, you're thinking, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I like thinking. I'm not going to rebuke you for not listening because you were thinking. That's good. Yes? Um, would this passage correlate to Judges 11 and 12? What's in Judges 11 and 12? Remind me. says, I will sacrifice the first one that comes to the door. Yes. Yeah, but is it a repetition or is it a contrast? It's, it's a contrast mm. because, like, the daughters are willing to sacrifice, but the father is more of an arrogant man who made a promise. Made a hasty promise, yeah. and now, uh oh. And everyone knows that's going to happen as well. Yeah. In the narrative, you're just like, uh oh, what's, oh, you shouldn't have done that, and you know who's going to come through, you know. You know it's going to be the daughter, and then it is. So what's he going to do? Well, he's a man of his word. <sighs> compare and contrast, because that, that's what's going on here, that you are meant to compare those two type scenes, and you're supposed to see the difference between them. And you can see the morality of the one and the immorality of the other, again, by contrast. And type scenes allow you to do precisely that. Just like I talk about regularly in literature in my classes where I talk about the different types of literature and the use of allusion, the allusion is there. You have an earlier story in mind when you're reading the later story and you are to hold the two up to one another. And you're learning something about the current situation by comparison with the previous one. Something's being said. The Bible works that way as a whole. And again, I said to you, I don't know which, the first, the second lecture, how important the, it is to see the whole of the Bible as a work of literature and see each story in relation to foregoing stories and so forth. That's why the codex in putting them together as one text is really important. So we talk about the 66 authors and different uh, uh, books of the Bible, but really it need, it, as a literary genre, it needs to be seen as, as one. And it really almost... I think the hermeneutic key for it, if that's the right word here, is in Revelation 12. Revelation's the last book in the Bible. It, uh, so it's the conclusion of it, but really it's a commentary on the whole of it. And Revelation 12 functions as the explanatory the key, the legend, you have to read this, and then this explains what's going on in the book of Revelation, but the whole Bible as well. It's that apocalyptic picture of the dragon and the, you know, the beast and the lamb, or the, the mother bearing a child, etc. But the indeterminacy I just find fascinating. And so there's an encounter that takes place. Where does it take place? It takes place between person whom God is addressing. The reason it's powerful is that God speaks to us in scripture as well. Where is he speaking from? Well, we have the words on the page. Yeah, that's true, but we read words on a page in every text that we read, and this one seems a little different. So it speaks to us and demands a response. There's an accountability to it. So there's a God remains Lord in the encounter in an indeterminate space, even when you're reading it in the privacy of your room. Uh, that's just, uh, that's, not a, I don't, that's not a literary feature per se. That's the unique aspect of, of, the, of the story. Um, so the setting is physical. I just talked about that. It's got indeterminate. And when it is, uh, Geogra geographical details are given. Uh, they often seem di digressions, irrelevant, but they do have a literary effect still. So if you're going up a mountain, you can envisage that it's, it's a hard task to walk up a mountain, and that has a, there's a certain effect of that. Or if you're in a desert again, or if you're in a city again, that has a certain literary effect, even if it seems like a digression. Uh, as far as the setting, um, as, as atmosphere, these tend to be foils to the action or, or, uh, or reinforce it. So in uh, the story of Jacob, for instance, 
uh, Genesis 35, verse 14. Uh, Jacob is a man, this is Robert Alter's commentary. Jacob is a man who sleeps on stones. You ever try to sleep on a stone, by the way, a stone under your head? You ever tried to do that? You slept outdoors? Terrible. You get older, you don't do that stupid stuff. You don't want to do it when you're young either. When you get older, my goodness, I'm not doing that again. But he sleeps on stones. He speaks in stones. He wrestles with stones. He contends, he contending with the hard, unyielding nature of things. Whereas in pointed contrast, his favored son will make his way in the world as a, he, as a dealer in the truths intimated through the filmy insubstantiality of dreams. So Jacob deals with hard stuff, the tough guy, whereas Isaac, not Isaac, uh, Joseph. Joseph is the dream guy, the dreamy. How different are those two? How different? Yes. He does. Yes. Absolutely. And then he comes to dreams. We don't get the sense that Jacob is that sort of figure. He's a, he's a tough guy, Jacob. We don't get the sense that Joseph's a tough guy. Right? I I'm not saying he doesn't suffer. I'm... Yeah, but God works through dreams through Joseph, whereas Jacob doesn't get dreams. He just wrestles. There are theophanies there, but he's not working through dreams. He, anyway, um, Alter's point is that there's a, a symbolism that becomes an extension of a person's character. So Jacob, Jacob puts a stone under his head at Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. He sets up a stone to commemorate his vision of God, Genesis 28. He single-handedly moves a huge stone at the well that required shepherds to water their flocks only when everyone was present. Jacob does it all by himself. The rest of them, it takes the whole bunch of the shepherds to move it. Jacob just moves the stone. Um, and he sets up a heap of stones as a testimony uh, to a pact that with his father-in-law. It's a a testimony to a, a, a peace treaty. We want no aggression hereafter. And, and then he raises a pillar of stone at Bethel in uh, Genesis 35 to renew his covenant with God. So he's always lifting stones and using stones. Whereas Joseph, the story of Joseph is one dream after the next. I'm not saying there's no suffering and both of them are tough in their own way, but God, Jacob works with stones, his son with dreams. Very interesting use of the setting as a sort of a symbol. Uh, then there's the cultural settings. What shall we use as an illustration there? Uh, uh, Esau selling his birthright. We already talked about this as a good illustration of this. Uh, it's usually presented as Jacob stealing the birthright. Not true. He did not steal it. There's no theft. You can transfer a birthright through bartering. Entirely possible. Jacob is, uh, is uh, bartering. He's always bartering. He barters with God as well. He's a, trying to get the good deal in this. He wants to uh, get his birthright, and he's clever. You swear an oath before you eat the stew. Not after, before, because you're not going to do it if you eat the stew. I'm going to take away my advantage here, which is you're willing to do this if you are so hungry for the stew that uh, you'll say anything. In fact, he says that. He knows what his brother's like. Ah, I got him right now. Here's the only time when he would ever, ever, ever do this. Now let me negotiate with you. I've got you. And when he makes swears an oath, then it's a legal transfer. And it's entirely bonding. That's a, that's a cultural setting. 
So it's not Jacob being uh, extraordinarily um, deceptive and wicked. It goes with the context. There's a cultural setting there of barter and exchange, even with birthrights. Yes? If there's a dispute, I think there does. It can only be resolved by a witness. And at least in Mosaic law, there has to be a witness. If there's a dispute over it, apparently they're not willing to do that. They're men of their word. But he could have, Jacob could have said, I never said that, and why? I didn't do that. What, why would I ever do that? Yeah. That's what I mean. What are you talking about? Why would I do something so stupid? But, uh, but so Esau despised his birthright. That's what the passage is revealing there. Um, so that's the cultural setting. Um, and similarly with Abraham and Sarah having a son by the maiden Hagar, this is also a cultural context. This can be an heir. And I would say the same thing it goes all the way into the Greco-Roman period. Uh, and most people don't know this. In the, even if you have a natural heir in the Roman era, here's your wife, your legitimate wife, you have a son. The son becomes your son when you adopt him. And you can, you can, you can at any point in his life say, you are no longer my, you are not my son, and I am not adopting you. And the father can do anything, including kill his children and his wife in, in Rome. It's when you become adopted that now you have legitimacy, but not when you're born. And therefore, they discard even their natural children at birth. They don't want them. Set them out on the streets. This is not my child. It becomes my child when I say it's my child, not before that. They're not saying that they weren't the father, but it's the adoption that makes it. That's the context. And so similarly, you can have a child if you claim it by virtue of other means other than your wife. It's a cultural context. Yes? Which is why Romans 8 is so important for us. Explain. Um, so you were our this, adoption? Yeah, our yeah, adoption. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's completely on God's hands. Absolutely. So he initiates it, and he adopts us as his children. So we're not natural children. We are adopted. Correct. And that thereafter comes the pattern of adoption that Christians have used uh, ever after. So early Christians adopted these kids that were thrown out on the streets as their own. Because God did this with them, therefore they should do it to others. In our day, adoptions become a very political and twisted mess. But it's a Christian uh, convention to adopt based on the fact that they, their nature is to be adopted children. And as such, not illegitimate, but legitimate, right? So we think natural is legitimate. Adopted, it's a legal thing, but it's not, doesn't have the same legitimacy. Well, every Christian, even if you're born into a Christian family, your natural parentage is far less important than the fact that you're adopted by God as his children. Remember, God doesn't have any grandchildren. If your parents were Christian, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. You have to be adopted by the Father. So you have to acknowledge him, that he is your Father. Really important. Uh, personally, in terms of the outworking in your church, your life, etc., to recognize that, and that you're thereby looked after by your Father. And his father, your father, that Father is better than your Father. Even if you've got a good Father, that this Father will provide for all of your needs uh, forever. Um, so those cultural settings, I think, are, are there, and they're important ones. Uh, let me talk about the story of Abraham, because it's really good and too good not to pass over. And it's one that illustrates everything that has just been stated here. So we'll begin, in it, but I, I'm not going to go through the whole text, because the whole text spans from uh, Genesis 11, verse 27 all the way to Genesis 25, verse 10. So the story of the call of Abraham all the way to his death uh, constitutes, there's a unity there. It's a series of little stories in it, but the whole of it is also a story, right? 
It's a long story, just like Joseph, to some degree like Noah, but, but Abraham, way longer. Certainly, uh, um, Jacob will have a similar type of story, so the, the patriarchs there. But the plot construction follows uh, uh, the pattern of a, there's a unity, there's a coherence, and there's an emphasis. There's a unity to the whole of it. There is a coherence to all the separate little uh, sub-stories within it. There's nonetheless a coherence in it, and there's a consistent emphasis in it. It's consistent. A God calls, Abraham answers. God promises, Abraham wants confirmation of it. God demonstrates that he'll do it. And then there's some time, and then assures him that he'll do it. And then sometimes time passes. God always does what he said he was going to do, but he doesn't do it immediately. Lots of conflict, lots of resolution. Uh, and within this, there is a, um, and I want to read this fantastic quote, which is uh, on page 71, if you're touched. So character produces action. Note the emphasis on character in Christian theology, in discipleship. Character is the main emphasis of Christian education, in fact, I'll even say. Not the conveyance of knowledge, the production of character. What sort of people are you? You will demonstrate that in all of your actions, but what are you like? Here's the quotation. Character produces action. Conversely, characters are known to us mainly through their actions. That is, through the plot. So there's a bit of... It is all about character, but character produces the action. On the other hand, character is revealed by the action. So once again, character produces action. Conversely, characters are known to us mainly through their actions. That is through the plot, the stories. So why are we told consistently told stories? Because in stories, actions take place that reveal character. And remember, the importance of uh, God, uh, as opposed to all the idols and the, so the so-called gods of the world, is that God is holy. That's the root commandment of scripture, be holy as I am holy holy. Leviticus 19.2, I believe it is. Echoed by Peter. Be holy even as I, your God, am holy. That's the root commandment. What does holiness look like? Go to Leviticus and it's all laid out. That's the, that's the court, it's the main text that, for, for Jews, it's the book of Leviticus. It's the holiness code. And it's expressed in a myriad of ways. And all the myriad of ways are ways of conducting yourself or acting, but they reveal your character, and your character is to be like God. Remember, human beings are made in the image of God. Remember that back in Genesis 1, 26, right? God made them in his own image, male and female created him. Um, in his image created him, male and female created them. In the Imago Dei, okay, so we bear the image of God, but note there as well, important point, we're made in the image of God, but we aren't the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. We're made in the image, but we aren't the image, whereas Jesus is the image. Colossians 1.15, I believe. He is the image of the invisible God. Whereas we're made in the image, but we aren't the image. So we are not godlike. There's nothing of God in us, per se. We're the image of the image, and the image there is a perfect reflection. In Jesus' case, in our case, we are to be like him by being holy. Hence the importance of holiness to a Christian. And then Paul writes that, or it's all over the place, people will know who you are by what you do. Because your actions are bespeak your character and only God is holy the world is not you will show this by the way you love one another etc
So character produces action. Characters are known, on the other hand, mainly through their actions, that is through the plot. So the stories are there because we live our lives in a temporal progression of events. Our personal story, our personal biography, and those stories are opportunities for our character to be developed or also to manifest itself. You're going to be faced with choices. Are you going to do the easy thing? Which is just fudging the truth a little bit. Or the right thing. Or are you going to do the hard thing, which is the right thing? Each opportunity is an opportunity to, for your character to be demonstrated, but also to be developed. So this is why I say don't cheat on your essays. The plagiarism thing, which is a totally stupid academic offense. It's, it's totally stupid, which is why I say, why do you do it? It's like the consequences for plagiarism historically in academia are pretty severe. How come? Because it's, it's a stupid offense. Because it's, it's a trivial thing. So why are you going to pound people and kill them for plagiarism? Because it's a trivial offense and, it's, it, and it reveals character. So if you're willing to do it over a mark on your essay, what are you going to do when there's real pressure on when your family's livelihood is at stake? Or you're, right, and you're, the, you're, you're an adult and now you're at a stage in life when people are counting on you. Are you going to fudge things and just twist things? Because you, you'll demonstrate that earlier in your life already. And I already know what you're going to be like later in life if this is how you act early in life, unless you repent, which you can always do. But that's why plagiarism is a serious offense, because it's trivial. See? Because it doesn't matter at all. So if you're willing to do it when it doesn't matter, what are you going to do when it does matter? Oh, you're going to, of course you're going to be a flop. Yes? Um, in the sense of character, could the narrator themselves of like the, the Genesis with Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice and stuff like that, could the narrator not be, like, be seen as the character in and of itself because they have understandings that Abraham and Isaac, etc. don't have? Well, who is the narrator, though? That's the thing. So the narrator as we call the narrator, only becomes evident in if there's a commentary on it. And those are very rare. It's not that they're not there. We talked about the uh, places in which there is a commentary. But it's very brief and it's very rare. It tends to be the characters themselves that speak and there's a resolution to the action through the drama of what takes place. But there isn't actually a narrator commenting on it. And yet there's, there's an uh, unspoken either judgment of what's just happened, a condemnation, or an endorsement of what's happened. But in either case, we're left to some degree having to figure it out for ourselves. And apparently, we can understand what's right and wrong in the text without the guidance of the narrator. Because the, he doesn't guide us. If he wanted to, he could. He doesn't. Uh, but, but you do get it when you read more and more of the stories, what's contained in the biblical text, you get a clear sense of the character of the narrator, which isn't the same as the author, and the human authors, because there's a consistency throughout, right? So that in that sense, it's the word of God. All of the, and that's the Christian understanding of what scripture is. All these human authors, God spoke through them. Different times, different situations, etc. but there's a consistent a coherency to all of that and so we don't have to guess what the narrator is thinking because we've already he's revealed it through the stories and the more you come to read the stories consistently the more you come to understand the mind of God because he is speaking to you not just the characters but to you reading the story it's an extraordinary thing it's true of every novelist as well, to some degree, but novelists are a little bit less certain of themselves and they're going to make sure that you understand what they're trying to say by telling you what they think. The more they do that, the worse the story, I think, almost. And if they're telling you what to think they, uh, about something which you would never have come to as a conclusion without their help, then they're trying to manipulate you, which doesn't work very well in my experience. Yes? So then how would you categorize information given by the narrator author that's not specifically spoken by a character? How oh, would that be categorized? Oh, I, cate I did that earlier. So, okay. um, 
So I'll, I'll repeat, that's fine. So, no, that's okay. So there's, a, sometimes it's a description, that's just the description of the scene, but the, uh, it's commentary, I called it. Okay. So there was, there was the, uh, f mm -hmm. so the four modes of narration. There was the direct narrative, there was the dramatic narrative, which is the character speaking, there's the description, the setting of the scene, and then finally there's commentary. And it's very, it's, the commentary, as I say, is very brief. Of every once, and so every once in a while you get a comment like, and God was displeased. As I say at that point, you're like, mm -hmm. But often there's no such displeasure being revealed. But we know that God is not pleased with what's just happened, but there's no comment on it. Other than sometimes a prophet will come in and say, here's what you did, and now you're going to get it because you knew this was wrong. How do they know? Well, often they're warned about it. But even if they're not warned, like was, was David warned about committing adultery with Bathsheba and killing Uriah the Hittite? Was he warned about this? No. Not in the text, but he is presumed to know that that's wrong. Why? Well, because in the Ten Commandments and the case, various case, of course, it's committing adultery, committing murder. He doesn't need to be warned about it. It's, he has, he's been warned, actually. What was the third one? So the third one is description, the description of the scene. I, I the second one. Okay, first one is direct narrative. Yeah. Uh, if you want, page 43 in the text. So you can put, okay. right? Direct narrative, uh, the dramatic narrative, the description, and then finally uh, commentary. Thanks. But page 43 and it amplifies that. Okay? Thank you for asking. No, really. So in the story of Abraham, um, we get uh, uh, these various uh, lengthy narrative. Uh, so I'm going to go from page 66 there. So the unity of character, I talked about a unity of action, uh, and uh, I'm taking it from page 66 uh, in Riken's text here. A long story which contains episodes within the story, just like the story of King Arthur and his knights is all taken as the story of King Arthur, but there are various episodic instances like Sir Gawain or Lancelot, but they all fit in with the grand story of King Arthur and this kingdom, Camelot, and the golden age it represents, and all of them fit into that story in their episodes. The same thing with the life of Abraham. There are episodes that are part of the broad story that begins back in Genesis 11 and concludes in Genesis 25. So here's the story. Um, it's a unified action. We are asked to identify that story. It's not identified for us as such, we are, in reading it, supposed to connect the dots. So by the time you come to Genesis 25 and the death of Abraham, you recognize the whole story has been told of his life. And then you have to put together all of the episodes in your own head. What did, how did God work in the particular circumstances of Abraham's life at various stages? And note there are lots of gaps in the narrative there. Like you might give him, how many is that, 14 chapters? Those are huge gaps where we know nothing about his life. Um, so first of all, you divide them into the constituent parts. So if you want to take the whole narrative, the constituent parts are the episodes. Uh, and these are the building blocks for the story. Um, and there, it's a complex plot. There are various threads of action. Uh, Riken comments, and I think he's correct, it is a variety of heroic narrative. Abraham's the hero without a doubt, right? He's a, he's a type of hero. And the hero is what holds the story together in this case. So in that sense, there's something almost epic about it as well. Uh, there's also a unity of action because the Abraham is the actor throughout the story. He's the one that's driving on the action. So there's a unit, 
unity of character in Abraham, a unity of action in what Abraham does. And he uh, is a, has two aspects. He's a religious hero, plays a prominent role. He's the man of faith, referred to throughout scripture. He's the archetypal man of faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, when it talks about the, in the book of Hebrews, those who live by faith and died by faith, Abraham's the guy. He's the archetype. He sets the pattern for those that follow him. Uh, so he's a religious hero, but he's also a domestic hero. His family matters to him. And we are not to see them in separation. This is important. It's really important, actually, that uh, Abraham's uh, duties to his families are are a key part of his heroism, even his religious heroism. Have you ever thought about the Ten Commandments and the laws that are given? This is family law. So there's the first four commandments. They all relate to how to relate to God, but the, the next six are the uh, preserving the integrity of the family unit. And thereby human nature with it. So if you want to protect individuals, you got to preserve the family. Individuals come out of families, but their families are an important part of it. You break the family and you break individuals. If you don't preserve the family through the Decalogue, you are going to find that individuals are irreparably harmed because they can't, they can't thrive outside of that context. And you think about what's happened in our culture to individuals and broken families, etc. It's not that they cease to be individuals, it's just that they are They've been offended. So he's a religious hero, he's a domestic hero, which means home means not just your, your house, but your land and your possessions. And Abraham thrives. He's the wealthiest man, uh, one of the wealthiest men in all of scripture. That's the product of God's blessing and his faithfulness to some degree. So he's the head of his family emphasized all over the place. Really important. In, when, in churches are referred to God's family. God's the head of the family. But he has under shepherds who will act, or pastors who will act to guide the sheep. And the people are called the family of God. The importance of the family. Once the, it's there again. So there's a religious dimension, there's a familial dim dimension. There for sure. Um, so that's the unity of character, the unity of action in a very complex story like that of Abraham. There's a, a unity to the various episodes that take place. And the crucial principle is how these you know, events are connected causally. Because Abraham did this, then this happens. Because this was done, then this happens. So they're not an arbitrary sequence. It's not without any unifying thread. The unifying thread is causative. This causes that. Because he does this, that. And it's all, it's all testing his obedience. And he doesn't always obey, by the way. So it's not just a su succession of events. It's a chain of events linked by cause and effect. And the cause and effect, because he acted in this way and revealed his character in this way, now God's ready to do it. God could have done with, put it in another way, we'll conclude with this. The story of Abraham, God calls him, he says, you're going to be this. Why does he bother putting him through the ringer over decades? Why does he bother with this? Because after all, God plans it. God can deliver it. Abraham, you're going to be the means of it. Why doesn't he just... Do it right away. What? Why the decades? Because he wants his character to develop. Because God expects his people to be like him, to be holy like him. He's got to make him holy like him because he brought him out of a place of idolatry. He has to teach him what he's like, and he's going to do that by testing him. So the life of a man of faith, which is Abraham's, may take a long time. That's 
So the template of Abraham is not just accidental. It takes a whole lifetime. Otherwise, people, when they come to faith, they say, well, you know, just kill me now. That's okay. I don't have to endure all this. Well, no, that's, this is an unfaithful response. God is not done with you yet. You're not actually fit in some sense. If you were, then he would be finished with you. That, but he has a use for you. It will be your character, but also the blessing of others. Think of it, the effect on Abraham. It produces his character, his faith in God. And the uh, the way in which he develops as a such a great hero, but also think of how he blesses his whole family because of his faithfulness. So it's huge effects, pattern there being established through the narrative, the sequence of episodes that are causally linked. Really important. Whereas modern stories don't really seem to have, you know, this happened and this happened, but there's no causal link. There's no moral judgment or moral connection between I did this and then and this happened. Not, none of that. Uh, scripture never, ever does that. So sustain, sustain. I'll leave it off with that and we'll pick it up next time. Okay, thank you.